So how many people have used RxJava before I... Most people? How many, I should say how many people haven't used RxJava? Okay. Um, this may be a little bit of a challenge for you. Uh, I do start with sort of an introduction, so you can try to pick up on the stuff in that, um, but it is going to be a little bit more technical, and I kind of assume some things about RxJava going into this. So, uh, Okay. So my name is Jake Wharton, and uh, I'm here to talk about some of the more complexities of RxJava, uh, which is managing state. So once you've initially invested in RxJava, uh, kind of how you take it to the next level and how you can use it in a much more idiomatic way. I have a lot of content, so I'm probably going to be going quite quick. So uh, this beginning is, is part of a talk that I gave before, but I'm going to try and frame it in a different way. Um, but it will also be useful if you kind of don't have a strong uh, idea of RxJava. So I'm going to postulate that unless you, your entire system can be modeled in a synchronous fashion, that a single asynchronous source is going to break imperative programming. And by break, I don't mean that it becomes impossible to write your program with a you know a single asynchronous source or multiple. It's just that the the amount of complexity becomes so much and compounds uh, such that it becomes unmaintainable when you get into this like state soup, uh, and that's exactly what we're going to look at trying to solve here. So just a quick example: um, if we have you know some hypothetical class that's managing state, say the current logged in user, and then has mutators for changing that. Um, we would interact with this in a synchronous way if it were synchronous using, you know, very obvious uh, interactions. The problem then becomes uh, what if these calls become asynchronous? What if they suddenly uh, have to, you know, be written to the file system or database or because this is the mobile track, uh, likely have to go over an API call to your backend server? I mean, you can do nothing here, right? You can just be optimistic and say, well, I'm going to make these changes, and I, I think they're going to work, and I'm just going to assume that they're going to work. Um, this, of course, falls over instantly because you have network problems, uh, or you may have like concurrent updates from different devices. So you can start doing things like, well, I'll provide a callback so that when the request is successful, I'll know to pull out the new data of the user. Uh, this is starting to become reactive, except you know, in this simple example, we still have no way of communicating like a network failure. So maybe you'll write a, a listener, uh, a type that allows you to message both the success case and the failure case, and you'll update your sample to, you know, use this. Oh, that was fun. This better not be a software update. Yeah. Keynote quit unexpectedly. Lovely. Too much magic move. We'll edit this in post. Uh, where was I? All right. Watch it do it again. Um, so this listener will allow you to propagate you know, both the success case where the data was updated and the failure case where, say, the network goes down. And you can start creating a more um, you know, correct interaction where you have these things that can fail. Uh, but then the problem becomes that, well, what if you have multiple of these? It's not just that you have two cases to handle now. Uh, these things start to compound. So you have uh, four cases. You have the two success. Both could error, or, you, or uh, only one could error. Uh, and it could either be the name or the age. So, you know, by adding just one more asynchronous call, you've essentially got this exponential problem where the number of cases you need to handle uh, are growing rapidly. And then this becomes even crazier when you start to do things like compose asynchronous calls. So I want to make one, use the result, and then pass that to the next one. And then this is the mobile track, so we have Android to contend with. Uh, we're doing this inside of an activity, and we have to realize that there are other things going on that we need to take into account in addition to just the asynchronous network calls. I'm touching the UI. Well, I need to make sure I don't touch the UI after the activity has gone away. Uh, I have a listener that I'm passing into this method. Well, if the user rotates the device and the network call takes 10 seconds, we've now leaked this activity for 10 seconds. I have callbacks. Uh, these callbacks aren't specified what thread they run on. Because this is a network call, maybe they come back on a background thread, and we have to do the work to uh, move that back to the main thread. Uh, 
And also, this code doesn't even take into account user input, right? We still have to manage the, the edit text, the buttons. We have to disable them when the network calls into place. We have to make sure that we re-enable them. Uh, how do we deal with the fact that uh, this is just the name? What if we also have the age? What if we allow them to those requests to happen concurrently? Uh, there's just so much going on here, and this is where um, RxJava really excels in how people get into it. Um, but oftentimes, when we when we do it, we don't actually solve the problem here of of managing this state. Uh, so when we look at our code, uh, in this sense. We have to deal with talking to the network. The network is an inherently asynchronous source. Even if we're modeling it synchronously, that synchronous call has to be done on a background thread, so it's effectively asynchronous. You have the disk. Um, you have the user interface, which is something you don't think of as asynchronous. Uh, user interface is essentially itself an asynchronous source. You push text and data into it, and then it asynchronously returns click, you know, callbacks, uh, the interactions with the user. And so all of these things are going to be happening concurrently, right? We have network calls being made. We have the database being updated. We have uh, the files being read. We have the user clicking and dragging on stuff. And so you have all these things happening asynchronously, and it's your code that's sitting in the middle that has to coordinate all this. And it just becomes a mess. And so how can we not design things reactively when everything, uh, everything in Android is essentially asynchronous? We also can't forget the fact that once this animation completes, that Android itself is inherently asynchronous. So think about the activity life cycle. It can come in at any moment through a rotation or a phone call coming in, the app switching. Uh, we have broadcasts. We have push notifications. Um, any configuration change when the keyboard pops up. You know, all of that stuff happens without warning, uh, just any point in your app. And so you have to react to those changes. This is where RxJava um, really excels, and, and this is kind of the pitch that people that really uh, pitches uh, the pitch that really convinces people to use it. But as we'll see, oftentimes when you just start using it right away, um, you're going to wind up not actually solving this state problem. So what RxJava is really about in this example is removing the responsibility of our code in the middle and kind of hooking up these separate pieces to each other directly. So that when the database um, you know, updates, it, it triggers directly into the UI. We don't have to manually do that ourselves. When the user clicks a button, that automatically you know, causes a network request or writes to the database. When the network response comes back, it automatically gets propagated to the database, which then transitively updates the UI. We start removing our ability to, uh, not our ability, we start removing our responsibility to manage these things directly and instead try and hook them together and allow them to just react to each other. The ideal goal being that that, that imperative code in the middle goes away. Um, it's not that all code goes away, there's still code here. It's just the code that's setting up the arrows, not the code that's actually managing everything directly. And so to take our trivial example from the beginning and turn it reactive, um, we want the user to become a stream of users. So anytime the user is updated, it's just going to notify us that there's a new value, and then we can do whatever we want with that. Similarly, with the uh, mutators that are going to make network calls, we want them to become uh, reactive where they notify us with success or failure, uh, which is what a completable does. And then when we change, uh, change our code to actually interact with this reactive version, um, we could do much more declarative things, like handle that threading aspect. We can declaratively say, well, when you're pushing new users into me, do it on the main thread. Uh, and then when you're observing uh, this user, bind it directly into the UI, uh, except we still have that problem of, you know, is the UI active? Well, RxJava has a kind of a general solution for that, which is, uh, these things called disposables or subscriptions, um, they're kind of like a handle on an active stream. Uh, and by storing that in some collection, we can then use the lifecycle to automatically disconnect from all the streams at the appropriate moment. Similarly, when we're making these asynchronous requests, uh, we can also declaratively control the threading, uh, and we can also listen to the result and do whatever we like in the UI. Uh, and we also need to track that, um, 
track that kind of handle on the connection in our same disposables uh, list so that if the activity goes away, we can disconnect from that, uh, that stream and we don't end up leaking anything. So this is kind of what the initial cell in ArxJava looks like. Uh, and you get a lot of cool things. So we get the push-based updates. Whenever your data has changed, it gets pushed into UI. You never have to pull it out. We get declarative threading. We can move background to foreground and vice versa uh, with basically just a single line. Error handling, which I didn't really talk about, becomes um, easy because it's part of the stream and it propagates through the stream automatically. Uh, there's specialized callbacks, so in the case where we're making the asynchronous request and it just succeeds or fails, that's all the callback tells us. And then uh, we have the ability to bind into the lifecycle, um, in this case manually, but there's also libraries to do it automatically. Uh, and so this is like the, the pitch and the thing that sells people on RxJava. Um, but none of this really deals with that state problem. Um, you still have to kind of manage the fact that these requests are in flight uh, yourself. And so that's, that's what we're going to look at for the rest of the talk. We're going to use kind of a simple example, a very similar example of just, uh, you know, an edit text, a button, and then you type in your name, press submit, you get a little progress spinner as it makes an asynchronous request, and then that'll either succeed or fail. So if you were to write that with RxJava, this is probably what you would write. And so we're going to go through this and take a look at what each piece is actually doing. The first thing we're doing is uh, we're taking the clicks from the submit button and turning them into a stream. So we listen to this stream, and it's going to emit an item every time you click on the button. We're going to use that to trigger some other effects. Uh, so immediately, we're going to uh, take the, that act of clicking and turn on the progress bar and disable the submit button so that you can't press it you know, more than once. We pull out the name from the text view. We pass it to, uh, in this case, I'm kind of modeling this API service. We pass it to a service which uh, creates an API call, which itself returns an observable that we can listen to. Uh, and so flat map is the way that you take item emissions and kind of turn them into observables that get folded back into the stream. Because that's an API call, the result comes back on the background thread, and so we move back to the main thread. We disable the progress bar because the call has succeeded. And then if it's a successful call, we just finish the activity. Uh, and if, it's an, if it produces an error for any reason, we re-enable the submit button and we you know, show a really poor version of error handling, but we just show a toast of what failed. Finally, uh, because this is in the context of an activity, we're tracking the, the in-progress version of this uh, stream so that we can unhook from it if the activity ever goes away. So that, that kind of went through it in um, what it's doing. I want to go through it again in the exact same way except with a slightly different viewpoint. So uh, starting with the, the Rx view stuff. Uh, so this is from a library called Rx binding and what this does is take all of the bespoke listeners of Android and turn them into this very normalized unified Rx system uh, of events. So this is, this is like a big win. But then immediately we do something where we, we have a, like a side effect of the stream. So when you click on the button, we start events flowing through the Rx Java stream, uh, except we like jump out of it back into the UI in order to, dis to disable the button and show the progress view. So not the best, but this is still okay. Um, this is really bad. We reach into the UI very imperatively, and we kind of yank out data that we need. Uh, so this is, we're in this stream already, and we have to jump out and grab data from the UI. Um, there's all kinds of concerns here. So maybe we already moved to a background thread. Uh, you can only access the UI in the main thread. Uh, it becomes hard to reason about because you can't really see where the data is coming from. Uh, it's hard to test in isolation because you're reaching out of the stream. So once we get that data, we put it into uh, you know, the network call, which is fine. We flat map it back into the stream. That's fine. Declaratively move back to the main thread for the result. Also fine. Here's another side effect that we run into where in the middle of the stream, after we've done some network call, we again jump back out and touch the UI. Uh, and this is actually a bug uh, because it's a do on next, which means it's only going to run in the success case. If there's an error, 
uh, it's not going to call this do on next, and the progress bar is going to remain spinning. So this is like something that's subtle that if you're not really well versed in the operators, you're going to miss. Um, again, threading is a concern if we forgot to jump back to the main thread. Uh, what if we wanted to stop the progress bar spinner, but also like write the response to disk uh, at the same time? We would have to you know jump to the main thread, disable the progress, jump back to the background thread, write it to disk, uh, and also. If we have concurrent, if we have multiple requests going on at once, these side effects are reaching into the UI at random parts and basically are going to be fighting each other to show and hide UI information. Uh, success case, we finish the activity, that's fine. Uh, and then the error case is interesting. This is also another bug because in Rx, uh, errors are what's called terminal events. So if you make a network request and it fails, it's actually going to tear down this entire stream, so you will get it. You will get the submit button re-enabled, and you will see the error. But the stream gets torn down, so you can click on the submit button all you want after the first error. Um, the stream's no longer going to be there listening. So another kind of subtle bug. And then um, you know tying the op tying the operation to the lifecycle, um, one could argue is a bug. Um, so if you rotate the phone while a request is in, in flight, you're going to lose the fact that this request is being made. Okay, uh, let's look at this kind of from a diagram perspective and see if we see if it indicates how we can potentially clean this up. So we start with the UI producing events that go into our code. We know this is good. Then we immediately jump back into the UI uh, as a side effect to to show progress being displayed. Um, this is essential, but it's it's a little kind of weird, and we'll see why. Uh, and then we do the very impure operation, which we know is bad, of pulling data out of the uh, UI outside of the stream. We do the flat map, which makes the network request. We come back, we side effect again into the UI to you know hide the progress. And then ultimately, we have the subscribe call, which gets the result of the data. Um, so this is, this is like, for a single request, there's there's a lot going on here, and remember there could be two requests going on at once. What does that look like? Well, that you basically just duplicate all of these things, and we're not really solving any problem with RX here. We're just creating new ones. So let's look at it from a perspective of a single request. Um, the we know the stream from the UI is good. We want to turn these into things that we can react to, but we immediately side effect back into the UI. Um, this is necessary, but it's not quite correct. We need to find a different way to do this. Uh, and this happens twice in our stream, right? We get the uh, initial side effect to show progress, and then we do it again to hide progress. Um, the term side effect itself should be telling you that these are bad, right? Side effects are things that should be happening uh, unrelated to kind of the primary interaction, like logging or analytics. Um, interacting with the UI is not a side effect. It's like it's our primary effect. Like we, this is the direct thing we want to be um, showing the results in. So we know that's bad. Um, we know get text is bad. Talked about that earlier. The flat map, the network call asynchronously, totally fine. Um, when we come back again, the side effect, which could stomp on potential concurrent requests, and then we have the subscribe. So given the bad things in this picture. Um, where do we want to end up, right? Like, what, what could we do here to make this better? Well, it'd be nice if those red things just didn't exist, and then we get this, like, really pretty kind of flow of data. So what can we do to get there? Let's start with things that are flowing in the same direction. So we have data coming from the UI and going into our stream. Uh, currently, we have the click, which is flowing normally, and then we have this weird, impure thing where we're kind of yanking data out of the UI. What if we just combine those, right? Uh, everything coming from, if everything that we needed to fulfill this request came from the UI in a single package, uh, then we never have to reach out and grab things that, uh, you know, are outside of the stream. Everything would be contained inside that initial event. Uh, so we need a type for this, which we'll look at soon, but this represents both the, the click and having the data that we need to submit. Um, similarly, if we look at the arrows going the other direction, this is from the stream back into the UI. Uh, it would be nice if these were somehow consolidated. And you look and you see, well, there's two do on next, and then there's a subscribe. What if we just change the last one to a do on next? 
So the way to think about this would be the UI is always a side effect of the state. You know, we're managing the state and then we're side effecting into this UI. But that's kind of weird, right? The, the UI is not a side effect of the state. Uh, the UI is the way that we're translating the state into something that we can communicate to the user. Uh, if we could beam the state object directly into the user's brain, we wouldn't need the UI at all, and then maybe it's a side effect, uh, but we can't. The UI is the primary means of communication with the user, so it's, the, it's like the direct effect that we want to create. So this is bad. This is not what we want. What if we flip it around and go the other direction? Instead of having do on next, what if everything was pushed through the subscribe? Right? This is a stream of events, so there can be multiple. It's not just the final result. It can be all of the states of the UI being pushed at different times. Uh, again, uh, you know, before we were just kind of ignoring the result and just the fact that it was successful or erroneous did something. Uh, and here, we're, like the submit event, will also kind of need a more complex type to represent all of this data, which we'll look at in a second. So this is great. No more red. Um, if you look on the, the right side, which is like the UI going to our code, we have this, it's what's called a unidirectional data flow. Um, you have stuff coming from the UI into our code in a single stream, one direction, and then a single stream the opposite direction, which is our kind of state being pushed back into the UI. This is not a new concept uh, in general, in programming in general. So let's look at how we can actually achieve this in code. So we start with, uh, start with the arrows going from the UI into our logic. So we have the clicks, which is the originator of the event, and then we have this impure get text function that's yanking data out. And what we need to do is consolidate those, so if we slide that up, and when the click happens, we immediately grab all the data we need, um, that kind of solves that problem. Uh, in this case, I was, um, you, know, you could just emit like, the name, um, but that doesn't allow you to have more than one kind of stream coming out. So like we talked about earlier, we need some kind of event object that represents both the action and the data that's required to fulfill it. Uh, and then our you know, flat map down here is updated, and you can see that it's, it's no longer doing things impurely. It's using the data, using the event that's in the stream to create uh, the asynchronous action. OK, the arrow's going the other way. Um, so what we're trying to do here is communicate that the request is in progress, and then that the request either succeeded or failed you know, at the end. So let's look at this, and maybe we can fix those bugs that I talked about uh, earlier. So we need some way of pushing all that data into the UI at once. So we, we can no longer side effect out of the stream. Uh, so what we can do is create a type that represents all the things we care about happening at once. So the fact that the request is in progress, whether it succeeded or failed, and if there's uh, an error message. We're going to start with uh, the, the first event. So when you click, we need to somehow submit um, that the UI is uh, in progress. So in, like this, this would return an instance of the model where in progress was set to true. Um, and where we want to do that is in that first do on next. Immediately when the click happens, we need to tell the UI. So we know we want to somehow use this in-progress model, but we need to get it into the UI. Um, obviously, we can't do it in a do on next because then it's, it's going nowhere. Um, we can't do a map like we did with the event because then we're, we're actually just replacing the event in the stream. Where we need to put it is a little bit farther down. Uh, and so what happens here is I've taken the asynchronous observable and I've changed it so that it immediately starts by emitting the fact that it's in progress. So as soon as you subscribe, as soon as the, the click causes that request observable to be created and then subscribed to, it's going to immediately emit that event saying, I am now in progress. There's a slight problem here in that uh, after that we have this observe on and, and observe on the main thread. And what this does is it posts events to the main thread unconditionally. So when this click happens, uh, you know, it's going fil to filter down the stream. We're going to create that request observable that's going to start with emitting in, in, in progress. Uh, and then we're going to flow through this observe on, which is going to post to the main thread, which means that it's not going to actually, the UI is not actually going to see the fact that it's in progress until the next frame. Uh, and that's not what we want, because then we won't disable the button. We won't show the progress bar. Uh, and you'll just have kind of a, a little subtle skip. 
So what we need to do uh, is actually just kind of reorder these, where we say that we're only going to take the background operation, which is the network request, and observe its result on the main thread. But otherwise, everything after that um, will be on the main thread and will emit synchronously. So our other two side effects, we need to do a very similar thing. Um, also, you'll notice that like we lost the fact that we're telling the progress bar to show. Um, we're going to come back to that. The same thing's going to happen here. We're going to lose our view binding, but we're going to come back to it. So using the other two kind of, these are just like factory functions for versions of this model. Um, so success would you know, have in progress false and success true. Failure would have in progress false, um, success false, and then some error message. Uh, so we're just going to do a very similar thing, but we need to replace the, um, the success case with turning, the, turning into the success model. Uh, and so because the success case comes from the network observable, what we're going to do is actually put it really close to the network observable. So as soon as we get a response and that response is successful, we turn it into something that means success in terms of the UI. Um, so we take whatever the response is, you know, in this case, we're just kind of ignoring it, but uh, the fact that it succeeded then becomes the success model. And if you wanted, you would be pulling things out of the response and putting it into this model to, to actually use in your UI. And that's the same thing with the error. Uh, and again, because it's, the, it's because it's the network request that's erroring, we want to take its error and turn that into the error, uh, this error version of the model which propagates the, the failure message. And so if we look at this, new inner observable. Um, what's it actually doing? So it, it starts with uh, the network call. And if the network call succeeds, it turns it into a representation of success. If it fails, it turns it into a representation of failure. Uh, that happens on the background thread, which we then observe on the main thread so we can bind it into our UI. And then this observable, which is going to be this inner observable, the one inside the flat map function, is going to be subscribed to on the main thread. So it's going to click. We're going to click. It's going to turn that click into an event. And then uh, that's going to call the flat map function, which returns this background observable. Uh, but it's going to subscribe to it on the main thread. And that inner observable will immediately emit an in-progress notification. And so uh, we lost all of our like nice UI binding. So that's what we need to put now down in here. Instead of just taking success as a success case, we now receive this model object that we created that has the two booleans and the string, and we bind those into our UI in a single place. Uh, no more side effects, which is awesome. And then for error handling, um, you know, even though errors aren't from the network request or are being turned into something in the model, um, we still actually need to handle error handling down here in case there's some other exception in the stream. Uh, and by doing this, you'll basically just crash the app, which is what you want to do. So this is where we've ended up. Um, there, there's a lot of code on the screen, but it's logically divided into three very easy to understand sections. I guess I shouldn't say easy, but three distinct sections. Uh, you have the first part, which takes UI events and turns them into a stream of things that we want to react on. You have the middle part, which takes those events and does something asynchronous with them and produces a a single like unified model that we can bind our UI to. Uh, and then the third part here takes that model, subscribes to updates from it, and binds it directly into the UI. So we'll get, in this case, we'll get you know, two notifications every time there's a click. We'll get the one that happens immediately, which says something's in progress. And then we'll either get a successful or a failure one. And we've actually fixed all the bugs that uh, were in the previous one, where if, you, if the network call fails, it doesn't actually, uh, the error never propagates into the main stream. So if you click submit again, it's still going to work. Uh, and a really nice property of this is that that whole middle section is actually, doesn't know anything about the UI. And I can prove this by, turn, by slightly changing it to a transformer, which takes an observable of events and returns an observable of models. And then I can even rearrange this so that that transformer can be defined by itself. There was nothing about the UI, and then all the UI code is kind of grouped together uh, and just uses the transformer. Now, ideally, you would have these in separate files, uh, one that could be unit tested, and then the other that's the actual UI. These could even be in separate modules. There's no reason that the, 
um, the part at the top, which is actually the kind of back end of the UI, has to be defined anywhere near the, the so-called front end. Um, so that's just a single one. What about if we have multiple requests coming from the UI? Well, we're gonna do the same process of just converting it into this and then slamming those together so that we still only have a single stream. I wanna show what that looks like concretely because it gets a little more complicated and actually shows a problem with this. Uh, so I'm gonna flip those back around so we have th the three distinct sections. We have events coming from the UI, we have the asynchronous kind of logic in the middle, and then we have the UI binding at the end. Let's start with the UI. Uh, so before we were just using a single event, if we're gonna have multiple events, uh, let's say uh, the example I use is um, as the user's typing, say we wanna check their name with an API call to the server to see if it's you know, valid. So we're gonna need more events. Uh, so we now have a submit event and we have a check name event. And for convenience, I've made those kind of part of the same type hierarchy. Um, Kotlin works great here with sealed, sealed class hierarchies. We create another observable for this, this new check name uh, event. So every time the user types, you know, changes the text in the text box, we now are gonna get uh, a check name event in the second observable. And then because we want them to be unified, all events from the UI are coming through a single stream, uh, we're just gonna merge those into a, a single stream. We can use the type to differentiate which one um, is actually, which event is actually occurring. So that becomes the new kind of top part. Now the transformer needs to handle these, this new event type. And the way we do that is this one, you know, is already defined for sub the submit event. We can create another one that's just gonna deal with this check name event. You don't really need to like worry about what it's doing. Um, but a key thing to point out would be obviously that there's, uh, I have these giant red question marks because this, this indicates a, a problem. And the problem is that these transformers are directly acting on this model. And so if we're gonna have more than one request in flight, both of them can't be returning an in progress or a success version of the model because maybe they're happening at the same time. Maybe the results need to um, you know, be combined so that multiple in progress requests don't stomp on each other. Uh, we're gonna come back to this because there's actually a larger problem that we need to fix that will end up solving this one. So for now, just pretend like we put something there. Um, and again, we need to combine these so that they produce a single output stream, uh, in this case of the UI model. Um, but first we actually need to do something different, which is we need to figure out a way to split the event stream. Because we need to send only events from submit to the submit transformer and only events from uh, check name to the check name transformer. And so we know that you know, based, we're gonna do this based on the type. Um, we know how to merge observables, uh, but splitting observables is a little more tricky. Um, usually when you do this, you think of the, maybe the share operator uh, or the publish operator that you then eventually call connect on. But a lesser known ver operator, or version of an operator I should say, is the version of publish that actually takes a function. And so what this is gonna do is uh, take the observable that's coming in and allow you to subscribe to it as many times as you want and do as many things as you want on it as possible as long as you ultimately return a single observable from that function, which is exactly what this diagram kind of wants. We wanna be able to just split it, do different things with it, and then ultimately merge them back together and return a single observable. Uh, so this is what our thing's gonna look like, and then basically inside that function, we split the observable based on the type, pass it to the appropriate transformer, and then merge them back together. So this is our new middle section, uh, and then nothing has to happen down here at the bottom, right? It's still the model that's coming out of this, so we still just bind it to the UI. But, uh, you know, I left this kind of I, I went through this quickly and I left those question marks in there and there's, there's obviously a problem here with the model. And so the way that we can think about this is, you know, there's a bunch of, there's actually a bunch of things on the left. I've just been using the network. Um, but it could be a database, could be, you know, the file system, could be intents. And so what we're doing is we're taking the UI and turning it into a representation of events. Every, every interaction becomes an event. And then we're using this model object to take um, you know, state 
and bind it back into the UI. But what we've been doing wrong, or I should say what I've done wrong in this first section and what often is done wrong, is that we're using the UI events in order to trigger these, these actions that are asynchronous. And then we were using the model of the UI directly in the result of those asynchronous actions. And that means that uh, the asynchronous things that we write are now very tightly coupled to the UI that uh, you're building. And so what we want to get to is something to decouple them. Uh, and so we need some other thing to trigger the action. And we need some other thing to be the result of the action. Uh, and then the code in the middle, the code that's, you know, our code that's building these streams just becomes these, this translation layer between these two systems. Um, the top one is, is really easy. Uh, you know, you're taking your submit event from the UI and turning it into a submit action to go to this asynchronous thing. Um, this is super important for uh, reuse, right? Because otherwise the, the actions, the things on the left, are tightly coupled to the UI. And so if we had multiple places in the app that needed to do a database read or call this network request, we couldn't actually reuse it directly. Um, the bottom's a little more interesting uh, because you, you can't just jump directly from a result back to this UI model uh, because the result is just the result of that single action. You need something that's tracking the ongoing progress of the model so that when a request is in flight, you know, it's, it's setting that Boolean to true and then when it sees the success or failure result, which knows nothing about the UI, it can then turn that back into you know, in progress becoming false and then success becoming either true or false. So there needs to be some intermediate thing tracking the model updates, which is what we're going to look at. So the way to do that, um, the way that we would do that as like a human is you know, keep, uh, start with an initial state, and then for every result of an action, we would just modify it in some way. So let's say I start typing and I fire off, you know, the check name API request is now in flight. Well, I would go to my little piece of paper and erase false and I would put true. And now this would be my new state. My new state would be that request is in flight. And then that would eventually come back with success or false and I would, you know, erase the, the true and it would now be false. Or what if there's something happening, you know, concurrently? I start typing my check name, and I, you know, do the erase and turn it to true. But then I hit submit. Uh, and well, I know there's a check name in flight, but now there's a submit in flight, so I'm just going to leave it the same. Uh, but mentally, me is going to say, well, I don't really care about the check name request anymore because I know I'm now in the submit one, and that kind of supersedes. Uh, so I just leave it as is. And there's a way to do this in Rx, um, which we'll look at, which I'll mention, try and mention, try to remember to mention in a second. And then ultimately, when success comes back, you know, I would use my eraser and I would change in progress to false, and then propagate the result into that model. How do we do this in Rx, though? How do we have that intermediate state and react to these events, um, basically by taking the previous state and then slightly updating it? We need to start with some. Um, some version of the state. And so let's say we create another one called idle. And this is just the normal, like, default UI. Nothing, nothing interesting is being bound. It's just like the, the state you're in when you first navigate to the screen. So everything's false, everything's null, whatever. We have our stream of results. The stream of results is the merge of all of those transformers back into, um, you know, just a stream of data coming out from those asynchronous actions. And this is from where we're going to derive the transitions from the state. Uh, in Rx, the operator that allows us to accomplish this incremental state updating is called scan. Um, and it's, it's essentially the exact same example that we just walked through, where you start with a state, and then for every event that comes in, you get a callback, and you just give it, you return a new state. And that new state becomes the canonical state until another event comes in, in which case you get another callback, and then you can update the state in some other way. Uh, kind of ugly in, in Java, again, Kotlin works really well here with um, the when matcher uh, in sealed, sealed class hierarchies. But basically, uh, we're taking the results and we're mapping them back into the UI model. So the, these results have nothing to do with the UI. They're just actions happening in the background. 
and we're turning them into the semantic representation that we want to bind into this specific UI. If we go back to our transformers, uh, the things that take the actions, turn them into results, um, we need to update. We're no longer using the UI events. Each of these asynchronous actions has their own uh, type that allows them to trigger. And they're very similar to the UI events, but again, they know nothing about the UI. It's just the required data in order to uh, execute this action. And then instead of uh, returning, my slides are out or whatever. Instead of returning the model directly, uh, we're going to return, again, like a semantic result just to that asynchronous action. So, uh, you know, now at the top one, when we're submitting this name to the server, we're taking in an action which tells us to submit, and then we're either turning that into uh, success or failure, and as soon as that action starts, we're telling whoever's listening that th this request is in flight. Same with check name. Uh, as soon as you ask it to check a name, it will tell you that check name is in progress, and then whether that succeeds or fails, um, you get the check name result. Uh, and the code in the last slide then becomes, so we fixed, you know, we fixed these question marks now. We're, we're no longer dealing with the UI model directly. We're just, we just have these actions which um, not only know nothing about the UI, but now can be reused in multiple parts of the app, um, don't even need to be built in the main part of the app. These can be in different modules and shared. And so where have we gotten to? Um, this is kind of, uh, I guess this is like a summary of, of everything that produces this pattern. Uh, we take the UI, we take interactions with the UI where it's very tempting to create streams directly that uh, you know, cause some asynchronous action. It's so tempting to take those clicks view and just flat map them into your retrofit request. Uh, but in order to do, in order to do like proper state management, um, which then becomes the responsibility of the callbacks instead of the stream, you need to coalesce all the UI interactions into a single stream that you can react to. Put all the necessary data for performing whatever action into that event uh, and never ever side effect back into the UI because you, Im as soon as you do that, you're immediately stomping on your ability to do things concurrently, to have multiple requests in flight from the same UI. Uh, transformations, whether they're synchronous or asynchronous, um, triggered by an action which is not the same as the UI event. These often map very, very closely to each other uh, and will contain the same sorts of information, but having them decoupled is uh, essential to allow reusability, testability um, of both of these, both sides of these in isolation. Um, the results of these actions are ways that we communicate back to the, uh, the UI. And by UI, which I didn't really define, this is not necessarily like views. Um, this is the presenters, this is the controllers, the, the things driving the UI. Uh, and so results are the ways that these reusable asynchronous operations communicate back to that, that logic that's powering your UI, uh, the result. And that result has nothing to do with the state of the UI, it has nothing to do with what's being shown on screen, um, it just allows that logic to take that result and transform the state in some way inside the stream, uh, again, without having to do side effects and without having to maintain you know, a bunch of fields outside of the stream. Important thing with these results is uh, thread safety. And so I didn't really mention this, but an, an easy way to just kind of get rid of uh, any thread management problems is to ensure that these always emit on the main thread. Uh, and then your model update is going to be blazingly fast because all you're doing is matching on the result and then you know, changing a Boolean or whatever. Uh, and so that on the main thread is very easy. And then your UI is just then listening directly already on the main thread and can bind, bind to the model. Uh, and then we, the code in the middle is kind of our code that's doing the scan, which is taking, the, taking this model that we've created to represent the UI and taking the result stream coming from the actions and just like incrementally updating the model. Just small changes to indicate that a request is in flight or that an error message happened or that uh, you know, the server returned this piece of data and now that needs shown in the UI. 
uh, put all of the necessary data of state into uh, that UI model because it uh, affords all kinds of cool things. The first being rotation, which I haven't really talked about. I mentioned at the beginning about how we are tracking things in disposables, and then we kind of dispose of them all when you rotate the phone or hit home or whatever. The cool thing about this is uh, that cool little phone emoji can totally disappear, and everything to the left can still stay running. Uh, and basically, your models are still uh, running, and you, you always have kind of the latest state so that whenever the UI comes back, it just binds to the model. And so if you get a phone call, you press you know, your submit, you get a phone call, your, your activity swaps out. The network call comes back when your activity is totally gone and say it's successful. Uh, our, our logic, our scan in that center part can update the model to reflect that success. And it emits it, but no one's listening. But that emission is cached so that any, when the UI eventually comes back, when your mom finally stops talking, hangs up, your activity comes back, it binds to the latest model, and then immediately reflects you know, whatever that state is. In this case, it would finish the activity and go back to the previous one. Uh, but you no longer have to, exp and, and it's the same is true of rotation if you get a callback in the middle of rotation. You no longer have to really explicitly worry about tracking that, tracking that in-flight state because it's now been totally decoupled from the UI. Uh, and what's cool about this is now side effects can be used for side effecty things. Interactions with the UI. Maybe you want to record those. Maybe you want to log those. That sounds like a side effect that you can just shove on the stream coming from the UI. Um, what about logging the model going into the UI, seeing the uh, object that represents the state of the UI and being able to log that and record that, have that available in, say, your crash reporting tool so you can see the, uh, you can see the events and the models that led up to a crash. Another cool thing about this pattern uh, is that you don't actually need an activity or, or a real UI on the right side of this. You can test the entire business logic of your app by just using RxJava as kind of test primitives uh, to swap out how you create the events and how you read the model. So now you can uh, unit test this. Similarly, uh, we don't actually need the back end of the app. You can swap out that entire back end for the same kind of test setup, and you can now shove models into the UI at will and see how the, uh, the view is being rendered. Or you can interact with the view in Espresso and ensure that um, the correct events with the correct data is coming out of them. And so this would be good for, a, um, for unit testing the, the UI. Not, um, you know, you'd still want like full integration tests with Espresso, but this would allow you to test kind of all the variants of uh, your UI, all the interactions with it, and all the different uh, setups of the model being pushed into it inside a um, instrumentation unit test. And so this is it. Uh, it's, it's not a library. It's, it's nothing insanely novel here. It's really just kind of a pattern. Uh, and there are libraries that will assist with this pattern. Um, if you're familiar with uh, things from the web, uh, we're basically stealing Redux and Cycle and turning them into an Android version. Um, those libraries tend to want to put the entirety of your app state into a single stream, a single model that, that represents your entire app. I'm not quite sure that makes sense for Android, and you don't have to do it. Uh, this whole system could be a single view. It could be a single view in your view hierarchy that's just dealing with um, you know, some complex piece of state management. And then that component can be reused. Uh, it could be a fragment that could be reused. It could be an entire activity or it could be your entire application. And the advantage is that you don't need it to be everything. Uh, and in fact, I probably wouldn't recommend doing everything, but if you have, um, if each one of your you know, components of your app, be it activities, fragments, or something else, um, are built in this way, uh, they all become very easy to test. Um, it's very idiomatic in Rx. Everything is contained inside the stream instead of these side effects pulling things in and out, these complex state management problems. Um, there's no subjects, there's no relays, there's, there's none of these things that are, it's hard to say unidiomatic, but uh, are just not the ideal way, not the most idiomatic RX way of representing state. You want everything to be put inside of the stream, and when everything's inside the stream, you get this nice uniform model. Um, it's certainly more complex, 
Uh, it's not the easy thing to do, it's, it's harder. But I would also argue that it's really no different than um, you know, doing an MVP or an MVC, or this is very similar to MVVM. It's essentially an architecture, and it, it architecture inherently comes with a slight bit of overhead. There's a little bit of abstraction, there's a little bit of duplication, but that's required in order to get clean separation, to get the testability, to get the reusability. Uh, and so, again, it's a pattern. Um, there are a few Android-specific libraries which are trying to help out with this. Uh, I have a few opinions on them, which I won't include here because we're basically out of time. Um, but it's, if you're using Rx and that, that beginning example really resonates with the kind of code you're writing and then ultimately the problems you're having, um, this is something you can look into in order to take that state from being your responsibility to being put inside the stream uh, and ultimately and hopefully cleaning up a lot of that state management. And for that, uh, thank you guys for listening and hope that was insightful. Thanks. It's 11.22 uh, and this talk ended at 11.20. So if you have any questions, I'll be around all day, all conference actually. Um, yeah, that's it. Come see my talk on Kotlin at lunch. Mm -hmm.